Good morning, everybody. You all look so beautiful today. I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> Are you guys doing good? Good. Praise the Lord. I like that. Say it again. So I have some news for you. Pastor, as some of you know, he's on sabbatical for a whole month. But listen, this man has now taken sabbatical for, I think, over 13 years we were talking about. I, I think that's kind of unheard of, is it? I mean, I think it is, right? You guys are Zion students at North Point, right? That's like, you can't be doing that, right? So he's away getting refreshed and be, getting filled up with the Holy Spirit, coming back on fire to be ready to just bring it. So you guys keep him in prayer. And he, he wanted you to know you still have to come to church. <laughs> so you, you're not on sabbatical. And so um, right now, what we're going to do is we're going to receive the offering. So ushers, if you could come forward, please. And everybody bow your head. We are here to worship God. There is none like him. You are so worthy, Jesus. You alone are the name above all names. And we thank you for all that you have given us. Help us to just be able to give back, to increase um, your kingdom, to grow it. Use this money for, for your use, for what you want to do. Grow your kingdom, Lord God. We thank you for being a part of that. Uh, bless this day. Bless the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So you have me. <laughs> I hope you guys are doing. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I'm going to tell you something. And so I know you love me. But listen, this has been the hardest sermon that I have worked on. And the reason why is because we're talking about idolatry. And I, I, I'm just going to be brutally honest with you that the Lord has shown me things and still showing me things that maybe that I'm making idols of in my own life. And um, man, it, it's been hard. And so uh, however it comes out, I, I'm, I'm believing him that it's going to come out exactly how he wants to. But man, it's been hard. And I, you know, we all have to um, be able to listen, recognize and identify our, the, our idols in order to remove them. And in order to exalt the name above all names, put him back in his rightful place because there is no other God, right? All right, so you know, it's so exciting here at New Life Church, right? We got this new vision casting, right, that, that God has put on pastor's heart. And we've all been a part of that increased mission giving, right? Inviting people to church. Did anybody invite any, somebody to church today? Look at all the hands going up. And listen, I, somebody's here that you invited, right? And so hello, say hello, everybody. I do this in kids zone. So hello, everybody. Say hello to the new people. <laughs> We're so glad you're here. So yeah, good job. Keep on doing that. Invite people. So that's part of the vision. That's part of what we got going on. Also serving, having a heart of service, right? And serving in this capacity here at church, but also wherever God has you serving, right? Just to have a heart for that. You know, if you have a um, maybe like a stale walk right now, like maybe you're in a dry place, serve, and watch what happens, right? Give back, right? You can't outgive God, right? In missions and in service. But also, we're doing something here called the 21 days of prayer. And we, I think we ended yesterday, but we're starting again. So if you don't have this brochure, the 21 days of prayer, make sure you get it out there. Don't throw it away if you do have it. You know that when we come together and, and like-mindedness and one accord, the Holy Spirit is like, I'm going to move. Just watch what happens, right? And we've already been praying for some stuff. I love it. I love seeing the posts on Facebook that we're all like praying for this specific thing. Get, get, on, get on board with that because the more of us coming together in agreement, watch what happens. It's so exciting. So yeah, that vision, but you know what else? I, I think because we all want revival, right? We've been talking revival. Pastor just preached on revival. Now you and I know that it has to start here first, right? And we need to be in a position uh, to receive from God so that he can work in us to touch other people's lives, right? So we want people to come and know Jesus, but it starts here. It starts, we need to position ourselves to receive. And in order to do that, we need to remove anything that comes between us and God, Right? Make him the thing that your heart desires the most. That's what we need to do. Nothing beside him, nothing in addition to him, nothing over him. God and God alone, the one true God. So like I said, this is part, I think I said this, this is part one of a three-part series called No Other Gods. And we're going to be talking about identifying your idols today. Author Kelly Minter has a book called No, um, no Other Gods. And I was drawn to it because that's the same name of this series. So I was like, oh, I want to check it out. I recommend the book. It's really good. 
And she's talking about, an, um, in her book, in the introduction, she's talking about a time when she went to a museum with her friend. And she's looking at these Egyptian exhibits. And um, she sees this statue in the form of a sphinx. And she, she describes it here. She says, it's a towering statue in the form of a sphinx with human legs holding out a symbol of life. And she goes on to um, what she, she shares what she had learned about that, that the Egyptians would bow down to this exact statue, hoping that life would be extended to them, bowing down to a, a dead God, a cold slab of stone, hoping from life from that thing. And she says, I remember thinking how I couldn't imagine that anyone would ever believe that this lifeless rock could do anything, much less give life. And then she goes on to say, how could I ever hope life could spring from a stone until the next words that crossed her mind were this, you do it all the time. You know, it's that voice, right? That inaudible voice that speaks loudly like no other to the very depths of our soul, right? That's, that's the voice of God, right? Some of you heard it. Some of us, we don't want to listen to it, but it's there, right? And she goes on to say, Lord, I would never look for life from something like this. And in that same voice, But you look for life and lesser things all the time, every day. And then the next words on the page were, ouch. And I was like, oh, I feel you, sister. (laughs) Ouch, right? Do we, believers in Jesus Christ, 2022, do we look look for life and lesser things than God? Do we desire other things above Jesus? Listen, Idolatry is alive and well in the world today and even within the body of Christ, even here at New Life Church. We need to be able to identify them, to rid of them. For that which we worship, we are made slaves of. Either we're going to worship God or we're going to worship something else. And we can't worship two, right? One or the other. See, God is very clear when he speaks this. You shall have no other gods before me. The definition of idolatry is the worship of idols or excessive devotion to or reverence for some person or thing. That word before actually is um, the he- uh, Hebrew word um, spelled A-L. Al, I think that's how you pronounce it. I could be wrong. <laughs> um, it means above, upon, over, above, in addition to, besides, or between. We're not to have anything over God, anything in addition to God, and nothing to come between us and God. See, the heart, the throne of our heart belongs to him and him alone. That's it. An idol, and um, the meaning of that in the Greek and Hebrew is, means this, a false god, worthless, empty, vain, insufficient. John Piper says this, an idol is anything that replaces a wholehearted reliance on the true and living God. An idol is anything that your heart desires above God. And so we got to really, we got to ask ourselves this, what am I desiring over God? What am I running to in place of him? What do I go to for comfort, for pleasure? Colossians 3, 5 says this, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. That word covet means extreme desire for, for what belongs to another. We, we need to have extreme desire for the one true God. And I, I think if you're like me, you think maybe that idolatry is a thing of, of the Bible times, like the pagan cultures, right? The surrounding nations of Israel where they, they worship to the false gods of Baal and Asherah and Molech. And where they would pay homage or, or give homage to um, and, 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 uh, the false gods by um, doing like horrific things. You know, prostitution, sexual immorality, child sacrifice having idols and statues made of wood, bowing down to them, made of metal, made of gold, and worshiping the created instead of the creator. Romans 1, 21 through 25, we read, for although they knew God, because they did, we, we, I love this in Romans, that everybody is without excuse for, for knowing God. Like, right, you could look at nature and creation and see his divine attributes. So we're without excuse. So for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, Pay attention to this. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, 
to the, the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who bless, who is blessed forever. Amen. So we see that. We think about that in Bible times, right? In pagan cultures, those that didn't believe in the one true God. But we also know that the believers, the children of God, were also influenced by the culture. They were desiring and coveting those things that they had. They wanted that. They went after that and turned their hearts on the one true God. We, we know that time and time again that happened. Forsaking God for another. Judges 10, 6. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and Ashereth the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods, the gods of Moab, the gods of Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So we know that. If you come to church any Sunday, you know, if you're listening to pastor and you're not sleeping, I don't see anybody sleeping right now. <laughs> That's good. I'm watching. <laughs> um, then you know that this has been a problem in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation Idolatry has been a problem with, with those who are non-believers and those who are believers. But it is also a problem today. And we all would admit that. We could just look at the news. We could just look around and we could see that, that there is idolatry within the world today. Modern day bells, Asherahs and Molochs, still, you know, ch child sacrifice, giving up our children to the altar, right? Still sexual immorality, every kind of perversion. Images of today, bowing down to them. People, celebrities, self, social media, seeking life from their followers on Facebook or wherever, right? Bowing down to the gods of their own forming and the image of their own choosing. So we'd say that they're non-believers, but that's not us. We, we don't have any idols because we are believers in the one true God, right? But are we not also influenced by culture? See, we, I, I love the sign that was out there a couple weeks ago. It said this, we can't influence culture if we look like them, right? Have we become familiar, tolerant, accepting of, of idolatry, incorporating it, even uh, idols in our worship with Jesus? I mean, we come to church on Sunday, we worship God. Sometimes we come in on time even, right? We do a discovery Bible group here and there. Maybe we go to a men's group, youth group, Right? But then we serve the gods of comfort, convenience, identity, pleasure, all the rest of the time, right? Martin Luther says this, whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that is really your God, your functional savior. John warns us to be vigilant when it comes to idols. He says this, little children, keep yourself from idols. I love how the New Living Translation says it. Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Though the modern day idols uh, look different than from back in the day, they're still just as harmful and they mean to destroy and lead you away from God. And so we're going to talk about maybe what some of those modern day idols might look like. Really, it's anything that we're replacing with God, right? It's anything that we have given our heart to. But some of the ones that I wanted to talk about were um, a few things that I think I see a lot and also probably within my own life. The idol of comfort. We want to live comfortably, right? We want to, we have money. We want to make sure we have enough money. We're working for that. And some of these things are good, by the way. Like some things are good that we're making idols, but they're not good because we're putting it above God and we've made them idols, Right? Living comfortably, money, having a house, cars, um, you know, just s stuff, right? Okay, we, we make sure we have what we need, and that's good. We need to do that. We need to take care of our families, but then we also have a lot of stuff. You know how I know we have a lot of stuff? Because everywhere you look, there's a public storage building being put up. Oh, my goodness, right? Okay, so if it, a new building's going up, I'm like, okay, it's either hmm, it's either a dollar store or a dollar twenty five store, uh, it's either a uh, liquor store, or it's a public storage building, right? <laughs> we have so much stuff, too much, to bring us comfort. It's what, and we don't even use it. It's in storage, right? It's too much. I don't want to be discomforted. I want to. I want to live comfortably. Right. Another another way we live comfortably is just really like the the ease of life. Right. No struggles or not struggles that I can't handle anyway. Right. Do everything I could do to avoid discomfort, not going outside of my comfort zone. Right. I go to work. 
I take care of my family. I even go to church on Sunday. Don't ask me to do anything else. This is where I'm comfortable. I'm not going to serve because I'm not really comfortable there. I'm not going to invite people to church because I'm, I'm not comfortable doing that. And you know what? Then I might make them uncomfortable. Then we're all uncomfortable. Forget it. I ain't doing it, right? The problem is that we get so used to being comfortable that we won't allow ourselves to be stretched outside of that. And outside of that is often where God is trying to take us to grow us and to, to grow others through us or by our example. So instead, comfort becomes the desire we chase instead of, a God, instead of God and his purposes for our lives. Real comfort, though, comes from the Lord. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Going through some tr the valley, right, of the shadow of death, going through some hard times, and his comfort is, is there for that, right? We got to go through some stuff. We got we to step outside that comfort zone. We are going to go through some stuff as children of God, but we can, we can depend on his comfort, right, instead of the other ways that we might find comfort. Another God or another idol is approval. All my life, for the most part, I always wanted to be accepted. I mean, I had friends, but you know, I see some hands going up. Like, that was uh, people's approval. Man, listen, we don't need people's approval. If God is for you, who can be against you? Somebody might need to hear that today. If God is for you, who could be against you? Facebook likes. <laughs> I... I'm, I'm being transparent, all right? <laughs> so my, uh, I would sometimes put some posts on Facebook, and I, especially certain people, I'd be like, that's my friend. Like, why didn't they like that? Well, they don't like my kids, <laughs> right? Those are fighting words, <laughs> you know? I'm being truthful, right? I know I, maybe I'm the only one here. I don't know. You're all looking at me like, Facebook, what? What's wrong with you? You are an idolater. <laughs> I heard, I heard a podcast. I love this. Uh, it, the, only, the only like that, and I don't know if I already said this, but I'm going to say it again. The only like that matters is on judgment day, and it comes from him. I was like, word, <laughs> that is so good. But what comes out of approval, you know, that, that idol of, of approval is people pleasing, right? We've got to be a people pleaser, like fear of man versus fear of God. Proverbs 29 says, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Don't you want to just be safe in his arms? There is no one like him. There is no one like him. No one better. No one who can do what he can do. So when I was a little girl, um, some of you have heard my story about my stepfather. Um, I'm not going to go share that, but it was kind of, you know, dysfunctional, whatever. The, you know, we, we all have that now. We're all dysfunctional in some way. But um, it was kind of rough growing up with him. And I, he was definitely not the nicest person to my mom. He, he, was, he was good to me um, in that he wasn't, you know, abusing me, but he was not good to my mom. And um, I remember, though, just um, always wanting to get his approval and I remember write, you know, birthday cards or whatever, and I would just say, you know, I'll try to be um, a better girl. I'll try to be good. And um, I remember my mom came up to me one time and said, he asked, like, what's wrong with her? Why does she always say she's a good girl, you know? But, but I had that sort of um, need, need for approval, and I think it kind of goes back to, like, a, a rejection, you know, like that fear of rejection. Like, I just wanted him to... to to, and I couldn't believe it, right? Because when you make an idol of something, it's going to keep on taking more and more and more, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to take more to convince you, to more to, to uh, I guess, satisfy you. Fear of man versus fear of God. Galatians 1.10, we read for, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of God. Again, all that matters is God's approval. And are we pleasing him, not others, right? And you know how we please God? By trusting him, by putting our faith in him. And without faith, it is impossible, impossible to please God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he is a reward, rewarder of those who seek him. I love that. Some say diligently seek him. I love that verse because it's saying that we have to believe that God is who he says he is, the one true God, right? But then also that he rewards those who seek him. You get rewards for seeking God, but you don't get rewards. You get curses for seeking other than him, right? Other gods, false gods. 
Another false god um, is identity. That's a big one. See, since the beginning of time, our identity has been under attack and in question, hasn't it? So who do you get your identity from, right? Friends, social media, gender, right? Gender, self, me, right? I get it from like what I want, self-worth, my rights, my agenda, my will be done. How about this? Position, title. How about your jobs? Like, I don't feel like I'm worth much. I, there's no value unless I'm, I'm at, in this position or if I, if I get that raise, right? Or if I have that title, then now I'm going to be worth something. Now I'm going to have some worth and some value. No, that's, that's not where we get our worth and value. We get it from God. Our identity is in Christ alone. And he has so many good things to say about you. He loves you. He died for you, right? Uh, <laughs> thank you. Other modern, modern day idols, I mean, we, we could just list a bunch of things. Cell phones is a big one. And I didn't really want to talk too much about cell phones because we all know the deal with cell phones. But it is a problem. And working with the youth, it's like they're, you know, always they're, like, they, they're bowing down <laughs> to the, the God. of. But, you know, it's not just them. It's not just them. It's their parents. It's, you know, adults. Oh, we we're, 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 can't be without it anymore. And you know what it's become? It's become a safety net. I don't, I don't got to talk to you if I got my phone in front of my face. I don't have to have relationship, right, with you if I have my phone here. But that's not what God wants. He, that's not what he intended. He intended for you to have relationship with him and with others so that they would, through you, know him. Amen. Entertainment, TV, video games, pleasure, ooh, busyness. That one just came to me this morning because, <laughs> again, God's working on me. Um, and, uh, last February, um, my, my biological father passed away and I went, some of you know that, and I went to California. I had not been to California to see my family in 14 years and, um, you know, busy, right? We're busy. We're just so busy that we can't do that. And I, I remember just being with my brothers, um, and my sister and we're just like, we can't, we can't do this anymore. This is, I mean, the one thing that we got out of my, my father's death was that we can't let that much time go again. We can't be so busy that we can't have relationship with people. We can't have a relationship with God. By the way, my brother is here. Not today, not here. Sorry. I know, I'm so sad that he's not here in the building, but he's here in New Hampshire. Um, him and his wife and um, uh, my niece and my two nephews and my sister-in-law's parents and sister, eight people are here, traveled cross country. Now, see, this is when he says, like, we're not going to let time go by. He wasn't lying. You know, I'm like, that. he's my hero. He came in two cars and they traveled to come see me. And we'll also to uh, attend an Ironman <laughs> race. My brother's doing that right now. Please pray for him. Because it was he started, I think, like at 6 in the morning in Laconia. And um, he says, we have eight hours. He's like, but my goal is six. And I know he was a little nervous last night. But um, I, he just, I know he's probably doing great. But keep him in prayer. But, man, family is so, what a gift of God, you know. And I know not everybody has a great family situation but you have a church family, right? <laughs> Build that relationship. Listen, an idol is never satiated, never. It will always demand more from you until it takes all you have and destroys you. So we want to pay attention to some signs that maybe do we have idols in our lives? Like, you know, get with God and just say, ask these questions. What, what am I thinking about? So, that's a good question. What are you thinking about? Maybe this in the morning. What is the first thing I think about when I wake up in the morning? I know some of you are like turning off the alarm five more minutes, <laughs> then another five more minutes, then another five more minutes. Okay, after that, what are you thinking about? What's the first thing? I did this test, and I got to tell you, the first thing I thought about was not God, but I kind of tried to cheat a little bit. I was like, okay, I know that I have to think of God. So God, I love you. Thank you for this day. And, um, <laughs> and, then, and then I thought about other things, right? Are we thinking about the problems of yesterday, the to-do to list today, including fixing the problems of yesterday? How might the rest of our day look if we started off with exalting his name, taking that five minutes of the snooze time, right, and, and giving it to him, getting in the word, focusing and meditating on one, one verse, 
and just understanding what it means, like meditate, chew on it, exalt that name, magnify him over the problems of yesterday and over the to-do list of today. How would the rest of our day look? I bet it would be more apt to go to him throughout the day and to honor him. Less grumbling, less complaining, more thankfulness, right? Another sign is knowing, like, where do you run? Where do you run to when you're in need of rest? Where do you go for that? Do you go to a friend? Do you go to TV? Sometimes we just turn on the TV and we just relax. Binge watching TV, right? I just need to like, I don't want to think of anything. I want to be entertained. <laughs> I don't, and I'm not saying, again, some of these things are all right. But when we put it above God and we're running to that first, the, uh, the sign last week too said this, uh, make God your first priority and your last resort. Rainy, he's been on it. Like, I use both of them, right? Colin, thank you wherever you're at. That was awesome. But, right, make him your first priority, not your last resort. Jesus says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's so good. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Doesn't that sound good today? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Where do you go for your rest? Do you run to him or do you run to other things? Another thing is, another sign is, what are you holding on to? Unforgiveness? Pain? Are you still holding on to some pain? How about the loss of a loved one? Are we still holding on to I know it's hard. There's a grieving process, but if we're holding on to that and we're not going to God first and we're, we're not letting go, then we're not able to open our arms up and, and have him just like receive us, right? Because we're just so holding on to that thing that we are exalting above God. And I'm not trying to belittle anybody's um, or make light of anybody's loss, but we, it's time. Listen, we got to turn back to God. It could be loss, it could be um, hurt or anger, something, when somebody did you wrong, like letting go of that unforgiveness, sadness, jealousy, are we holding on to jealousy and sadness, anxiety, depression, like I hear a lot of people say this, even in the youth groups, like I have, it's my anxiety, my depression, no it's not, it is not, you're God, you're God, right, above that, are you holding on to sin, Right, maybe there's a sin in our lives that we just don't want to let go of, right? It, we're funny that way. We, we want all of God's blessings, but we don't want his correction or his instruction. And then when we wonder, where are you, God? God, you know, where are you? Why, why are you so distant? distant? Listen, God is not going to bless what he will not bless. He will not bless your sin. Are we holding on to sin and not letting go of it? Are we making an idol of it? I heard, um, I read a quote that said, Behind every sin is an idol. That kind of makes sense because, right, what, we're, we're turning our heart away from God and going our own way to, to what we want, to what brings us pleasure, or whatever the case may be. And then another sign is this, have you become comfortable with the things of the world? Tolerant, familiar, accepting of, of worldliness, and even incorporating the idols of the world. I remember when I said earlier, remember that therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their, their hearts to impurity. God, therefore God gave them up. That's like the saddest, one of the saddest statements I can hear. But God, God is a jealous guy. If you want something other than him, he's going to allow you to go into that. That's not God being distanced. That's us turning our backs from him and going towards something else. Because he is clear no other gods. So the question is, is he your God? Is he your God and your only God? Because it's on his terms, not ours. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord, your God who brought you. Sorry, I'm going to turn it there. <laughs> and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord, your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery you shall have no other gods before me you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth you shall not bow down to them or serve them for i the lord your god am a jealous god visiting the iniquity of the fathers of the children to the third and fourth generation to those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments I, I want to go back here 
because sometimes when we, we list the Ten Commandments, right? We know Ten Commandments and we're going, we want to list it. But I think we skip over verse 1 and verse 2. Um, God spoke all these words. When God speaks, we listen. When Yahweh speaks, we listen. I am the Lord, your God. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Yahweh, right? That is the right, proper name of God. The proper name of the God of Israel. It's his holy name. It's so holy that and we read in Leviticus that if anyone had said back in, in the Old Testament times, those whoever says blasphemes the name of the Lord will, will be put to death. Holy. They wouldn't even say his name because it's holy. There is no other name. There is no other God. It is the name like no other because it includes his personal identity, who he is and what he has done and what he's going to do, what he's able to do. He is the life giver and no one else is worthy of our affections. We read in Exodus oh, sorry, fifteen eleven, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? There is none like him. No one else is awesome and holy like he is. So the question is, again, is he your God? And I love that part where it says, I'm going to go back real quick and just show you. I am the Lord, your God. So whether we, whether we want him to be our God or not, or if anybody chooses him or not, we know that he is God. He is Yahweh. He is God, whether we like it or not, right? He is the one. There is no other one above him. But the question is, is he your God? Because see, everything else hinges off of this. If he's your God, then you shall have no other he gets your whole heart. I am the Lord, your God. It speaks also to this, his desire to have relationship with you, your God. He wants to be in a relationship with you. He loves you. And then we go on here. It says, "Who I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the uh, land of slavery, house of slavery. He is reminding the Israelites that he brought them out of slavery, out of oppression at the hands, the, at the hands of the Egyptians, miraculously delivering them through the Red Sea into the promised land. What about you? What has God brought you from, brought you through? What has he delivered you from? See, you are no longer a slave to sin because you have been offered life through Jesus Christ, the life giver, that name above every name. No other gods. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. That pretty much covers everything. It just That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> Nothing, right? No one else will do. And then it goes on to say, you shall not bow down to them or serve them for the Lord your God is a jealous God. Sometimes I, I kind of stumble on that or I did early in my you know, early years as a Christian because I thought, how can God be jealous? We're not supposed to be jealous. So how can, how can God be jealous? Does that even make sense? But it does because see, he's the only one that has the right to be jealous. He's omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God. He is all powerful, all knowing. He's everywhere. And he loves you like no other. He cares for you like no ever, uh, other. He sings over you. He delights in you. He is faithful to you like no other. He provides for you and he planned for you. He's jealous because you are in covenant with him. You are vowed to him. You are his and he is yours. It makes me think of a husband and a wife when, when they get married, right? You say your vows before the Lord. And, and if, if my spouse or your spouse or whatever is, has turned their heart from you and towards another, that provokes jealousy, right? And we're the bride of Christ. God is the only one who has the right to be jealous because, listen, he, he knows, he formed you. He thought of you before you were even uh, born. He had plans for you, purpose for you. He knows what's good for you. He knows what's not good for you. He knows our tendency to go away from him. His heart is for you. He sent his son to die for you. Jesus died on the cross for you and I so that we can know God and be known by God and so that we can share God with others. 
Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me. Since I appointed it an ancient people, let them declare what is to come and what will happen. I am the first and the last. There is no other God. So what I'd like us to do is just take some time maybe this week to, to examine our hearts. And so, Seth, if you could come on up. We are going to take some time to examine our hearts this week and just ask God to show us anywhere that we might have an idol in our life where maybe we're, we're struggling with um, finding rest in him alone or peace in him alone. Or maybe, you know what, maybe we're working in our own strength, right? Can I just tell you something? That's so exhausting. Believe me when I tell you that is so exhausting. Wow, we can depend on the strength of God, put our full dependency on him. And so let's take some time this week to ask the Lord throughout the week to show you any area where there might be an idol. Expose anything that you are desiring above God because we need to identify them in order to tear them down. We're going to be talking about that next week, tearing down those idols. So that way we can, we can exalt the Lord back to his rightful place, the throne of our heart and him and him alone. Blessing comes from that. Man, is there anything more blessed? Or, or can we be any more blessed in having that relationship with him, drawing closer to him, knowing him more? So I'd like us to do that this week. If you guys can write down on your pad paper uh, this homework assignment this week, examine, examine my heart. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. So I would like us to start that assignment like every day this week, you know, snooze button is going to be a reminder. Examine my heart, Lord. Show me if there's any way in me that would, is grieving you where I'm giving my heart to another. Show me. But we're going to start that right now at the altar. Have, have a time pressing into the Lord where he can um, help you, like examine, pray to him, examine my heart. Show me. I'd like us to be able to also take that opportunity to just magnify him above all others, false gods, all other things, all other people, all other thoughts in our mind. Give him endless praise because he is above all others, king of kings, majesty, right? And ask him again to help you find anything inside your heart and just draw near. You know what? Let him love you today. Can you just spend some time in the presence of God and, and, and bask in that? Let him love you today. Let him pour his love on you. You are a child of God. And I, and I don't mean this as a, a negative message or like, you know, just make you feel like you're this a bunch of sinners or whatever, you know, but that's a good thing to be reminded that, you know what, maybe there's something, maybe this is why my walk is not as on fire as it used to be. Maybe this is why I'm still struggling with depression. Maybe there's, maybe there's something behind that. Maybe there is an idol. Right? So it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And there's nothing better than being able to enter into the presence of God. And so if you would like to do that, Seth is going to sing a song and, um, and then also he will close us in prayer after. And so, um, I won't, I don't want you guys to leave. Uh, you're not allowed to leave right now. I want you to come to the altar or sit where you're at and just spend some time with the Lord. Can you turn down the lights too? And uh, listen, I love you guys. I thank you just for you know listening. And, and I just, I love that God loves you and that we have him for together to celebrate and worship him. And so let, let's do that. Go ahead and come on up. If you feel, if you want to stay where you're at, that's okay too. But definitely give him your heart, your whole heart. So for this song, this one's a 